Welcome to another edition of our COVID conversation series. Uh, this time we're joined by Juliet Tu. Juliet is a, a longtime friend. Uh, Juliet, I was just realizing it's been 20 years since uh, we've, uh, I met you and you were a doctoral student and I was a brand new assistant professor. Uh, Juliet has gone on from being a, a doctoral student all those years ago to becoming a very uh, distinguished uh, uh, scholar and uh, academic, and one of the leaders of the ac uh, academic community in China, uh, after having had a, a very uh, successful career in the U.S. and in uh, and in Canada, has been has been uh, at the uh, Juliet has been at the CKGSB Chung Kong Graduate School of Business uh, in China. And uh, Juliet, you're joining us, I understand, from Shanghai right now. Uh, welcome. Hello, Rajesh. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Of course. It's great to see you, by the way, for so yes. long. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Julia, before we get into the questions, that I'm, I'm dying to get into questions because you, re you, I'm hoping, will be able to give us a glimpse, uh, not only based on your academic expertise on consumer behavior <laughs> and on, on, uh, on social entrepreneurship, but also based on the fact that you live in Shanghai and uh, you're getting to see all this uh, firsthand. And... <clears throat> But before I get into that, uh, a few notes. So you're a professor of marketing uh, at CKGSP. Uh, you are the uh, director of the Social Innovation and Brand Research Center uh, at, uh, at CKGSB. Uh, and you also help run the EMBA program at, uh, at, uh, at CKGSP. So lots of admin um, roles, but also I, I know uh, from reliable sources uh, that uh, uh, from all the way from Minnesota when we were together that uh, you're a star teacher and you have this unique ability to uh, uh, put things in context uh, for those uh, who may not understand the context very well. So that's what we're, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you'll be able to join, uh, you're able to join us and I'm hoping you'll be able to do. So some background uh, before we um, jump in. Uh, obviously, much of the world right now is under lockdown. Um, China went through this process uh, earlier than the rest of the world, uh, and so some of what China may be experiencing uh, could represent a glimpse, potentially, about uh, uh, the future that uh, we may each live uh, in the next few weeks and months to come. Um, but the other uh, part is, we, in these COVID conversations, we've been having conversations with policymakers or what policymakers should do or what CEOs and leaders and various others should do or what NGO heads are doing and so on. I'm particularly uh, thrilled that you're on because what I would love to get from you, given your expertise, uh, is the sort of daily reality of, uh, uh, of consumers, uh, of small business owners, and small business owners in particular because in much of the developing world, that represents the bulk of employment, that represents the bulk of the economy. Um, and of course, as we know, uh, they are in many cases some of the worst affected, uh, and their lives, in, in the case of millions of small business owners around the world, um, there's there's a big question mark about how life will um, return and what normality um, um, will mean. So, a couple. Of, can you tell us a bit about sort of daily reality and specifically one of the things about constraints and challenges is that it brings out human ingenuity uh, and innovation. Uh, innovation on the part of uh, you know, policymakers, on the part of small business owners. Can you give us a few examples and perhaps we could try and generalize from those? Over to you. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Rajesh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, well, first of all, um, thanks for having me here. And uh, it's great to meet all the audience, whether hopefully I'll be able to see you offline sometime in the future. Um, I'm in Shanghai right now, uh, and it's May 1st, 2020. Um, so China has gone through this pandemic um, earlier than most countries, than all other countries. Um, but just to give you a sense of how life it is right now, um, this morning, because uh, it's a holiday weekend, so this morning, my husband took my son, my 11-year-old son, for a soccer game outdoors. 
So uh, things are definitely getting back normal. And I went out for a run for jogging this morning. And um, so people are just very excited to be able to go outside and um, meet friends and lives are getting back to normal. So there is hope down the road. So definitely look forward to that. Uh, everybody has the hope on that. Just on that, uh, Juliet, what is, uh, what is the situation with respect to retail stores and such right now? Well, uh, I think in Shanghai, in Shanghai, all the retail stores are open. Hmm. Uh, in most cities, um, retail, and in fact, this is, the, this is the big holiday break right now. So yeah. the governments from the center to the local governments are actually hoping to use this holiday break to stimulate consumption. Mm. And so lots of sales, lots of promotions going on. They are encouraging people to, to consume, to, to buy. Well, so historically, the Chinese consumer, uh, one of the virtues of Chinese society has been saving for the future. And especially when times are tough, all of us as humans have a, have a natural desire to want to save, which is not exactly great if you're a retailer. Yes. Yes, That's, definitely. Yeah, and it, uh, I mean, the virus, the coronavirus is being under control in China right now, but the economy has been, um, as everybody knows, uh, hurt, hurt badly. So there is this urgency to revive the economy and in China and I'm sure around the world as well. And so I've been sort of from, um, you know, a marketing professor perspective, as well as from consumers perspective, to see how our our country, how China is trying to do this. And I noticed that we're taking um, somewhat a slightly different path from other countries around the world. So for example, like in UK, in US, the government is putting forward this uh, whole package, like in US is $2 trillion. UK is doing something similar. But in China, um, instead of coming out a big package stimulus, this plan. I think we're doing um, different things, uh, such as you know, waiving rents um, and insurances for these small businesses. But another interesting observation I've been having is government, local governments are collaborating with these business vendors to give out electronic coupons to consumers. And these are, um, actually I did a bit of research, it started in Macau as early as February, early February. Mm -hmm. And then it started to um, spread to other cities in China, in Hangzhou, in Nanjing, etc. And so what happens is it collaborates with Alibaba and Tencent. So because e-payment is very popular, it's very convenient in China. So what they do is the government will issue these e-coupons. It automatically, well, you have to get it. You have to, 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 to get it on your um, platform. And once you have it, these coming forms of either 10 yuan, 20 yuan, 50 yuan, etc. But you have to, it works like a leverage. So you have to spend certain amount of money in order to redeem this coupon. So for example, if you have a 10 yuan coupon, you need to spend maybe say 50 yuan in order to use this 10 yuan coupon. And so um, just to give you sort of a perspective how much this is working, how well this is working. Uh, for example, like in Hangzhou, Hangzhou is where uh, is Alibaba is where based in Hangzhou. So it's a very beautiful city. Um, Hangzhou government issued twice these electronic coupons for a total amount of um, close to 250 million RMB. Hmm. So that translate that to pound that's 25 million let's take uh you know 10 so 25 million but how much consumption that is stimulating by 10 times hmm. so let me by make 10 sure times. That, Julie. um so if i'm a consumer what happens i get from the government of hangzhou these coupons on my mobile phone or no, it's like you get, so the news will say, well, these coupons will be sent out to the citizens, but not everybody gets it. You have to basically, within a period of time, you have to go on this platform, either Jifubao or other uh, wallet platform, mm -hmm. and then you have to try to get it within, everybody else gets it. There's a limited okay. amount of coupons. So yeah, so for oh, example, like me, I haven't got any. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you go on the platform, 
Uh, and if you're one of the early ones or lucky ones, uh, then you get uh, you know, a part of this uh, uh, amount. Yes. And then that allows you to buy online or can you also use that in physical stores? No, you can use it online as well as offline. Okay. So these coupons are primarily used in uh, retailing um, travel and also tourist places. Mm. And also um, grocery uh, food, uh, lots of restaurants are issuing these coupons as well. And also bookstores, uh, but primarily retailing. They can be used to offline as well. So this draws people in uh, and gets them actually spending, uh, yeah. partly subsidized by the government. Uh, and it is, um, it, it is uh, but it, it magnifies uh, or rather uh, amplifies uh, the effects yes. of uh, any government spending, potentially by a factor of 10, uh, uh, given the consumer. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Got it. Uh, I, now, and what, it's interesting because Rajesh, yours, yeah, sorry. Um, please, so please. you were saying, Rajesh, that saving is the big part in yeah. um, probably in these collective cultures. And especially if you think about in times like um, right now, yeah. um, people don't have lots of food money yeah. and so if you just to give people money um i'm actually not sure whether they will spend it yeah. and to what extent they will spend it versus saving it yeah. um but i guess the coupon works in a way from a psychology you know here's psychologists talking from a psychology perspective is a leverage i mean also has the expiration date if you don't spend within this period of time, it expires. Yeah. So in that sense, it stimulates consumption. Yeah, and and, and, and and that's partly because of this sense of scarcity, uh, both in whether or not you'll get a coupon, and then uh, if you don't spend, it will, uh, it will disappear. Wasted. And I remember some yeah. of the research uh, uh, in, in consumer behavior uh, about uh, how um, you know, of, of just coupon redemption behavior. Uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that it's attached to a, a particular time period uh, implies, therefore, that people are more likely to uh, redeem it, and especially as we get closer to the, uh, to the yes. date of expiration. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. Now, um, the, uh, a, a, a challenge, of course, um, there, there are retailers, and then there were manufacturers whose lives have been disrupted, um, and uh, supply chains that break down, um, and uh, you know you may have farmers in one place who have lots of produce, and others uh, who could use the produce, but uh, it's actually rotting. We're hearing stories about all of this. Uh, what have you What have you heard about uh, more broadly around supply chains or anything else uh, 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 um, that that involves sort of a uh, in, ingenious re response to to yeah. prices? No, that's a great question, Rajesh. Um, and this happens particularly too in times like this, where everything was cut down, mm -hmm. locked down, um, or just uh, you know a few months back. And so, if you want to buy something, you know, basically transportation uh, was down, and then a lot of the courier service were off as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what could you do? And this is where I think. Um, creativity really sort of business owners, these entrepreneurs, their sense of innovation really helps here. Mm -hmm. I've been amazed just to see, you know, what people could come up with in these trying, tells, trying times to solve these problems. So one thing I've been noticing is, um, well, you can't go offline stores. You can't go to these brick and mortar stores during the lockdown. But then online is still available. And in fact, the online is booming. The online business was booming ever since the lockdown started. And one thing I've been noticing is these, um, well, what I call, you know, uh, internet celebrity and doing uh, merchandising, selling products through live streaming um, online platforms. And so, in fact, live streaming, you know, you know, selling is not new in China at all. Uh, there was That's this very point. famous sort of interest. Exactly. Just can I just uh, sorry to interrupt on that? Just context, uh, Julia. Of course, China is famous for this remarkable increase and in, uh, and popularity of and success in 
so-called online to offline, all right? So yes. uh, in a way that much of the world hasn't quite seen just yet, uh, 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 all of these uh, stories about how they'll not only deliver the hot pot meal to your home, <laughs> Uh, they will also pick up the hot pot and, and, oh, yeah. and back, among other things. Right? So China has a, re a remarkable recent history of, um, of combining online with offline. Uh, and that's a useful context. So it's not as if this is a brand new thing. It's just accelerated uh, what made Yes. Sense. Please continue. Yes. And, yeah, and that's a great background. Uh, on top of that, it used to be just the online offline a combination but now what's happening is really you see these sort of celebrity um internet celebrity who are becoming a really important opinion leaders in terms of selling products online mm -hmm. and so well, what i'm talking here are not just talking about you know a rec uh, you know has to be a movie star or something could be a regular person but becomes an internet celebrity so for example, there's this guy called Li Jiaqi. No, it's a guy, first of all. And he's most well known for selling lipsticks online. And in fact, he was so popular and he was so successful. So in 2018, we we're now talking about like almost two years ago, 2018 on November the 11th. So that's our like 11-11 day, which is a big uh, you know, promotion day. Uh, it's like Boxing Day in the U.S. Yeah. And so on that day, so Jack Ma had a competition with this celebrity, Li Jiaqi. They both tried to sell lipsticks online through live streaming context. Yeah. And turns, well, I can share the video with you later and you can share with the yeah, audience. We'll put it on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll no, it no, it's the, really fun. Side. Yeah, and, um, and the results is amazing. You know, Jack Ma, you know, within like a few seconds, sold probably like 10 lipsticks. And this guy sold a thousand. And so, uh, so and, no, that was 2018. Now, exactly. fast yeah. forward to today, yeah. you know, during the pandemic, it just accelerated this sort of live streaming uh, marketing as well as business selling. A lot of products, especially a lot of traditional brick and mortar stores, and they are venturing into these online um, platforms. And CEOs and um, salespeople all going online, doing live streaming and demonstrating products. And most of them are experiencing really sort of tremendous success in terms of communicating with audience in the directly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. At, at scale, the, the, can I just make sure I understand this? So. Um, so if I'm a consumer in the, for lipstick, how do I know to know when will the live streaming happen? And I mean, I haven't, I'm a confession, maybe lipstick is the wrong category, but uh, <laughs> I haven't done so. But uh, can you walk me through what the process is? There, yeah. there are probably thousands of live streams going on as we speak. So is there an aggregation? Method or yes. how do some break out as celebrities and others not? Lots of questions. Yeah, no, no, there are these, well, of course, there are a lot of, you know, live streaming platforms, but there are three major ones, okay. which accounts for majority of the market share. And so the biggest one is on Taobao, uh, yeah. which belongs to Alibaba. So Li Jiaqi, the lipstick guy, and he sells, he goes live streaming on Taobao. And so Taobao is the place where um, basically is like the biggest live streaming um, place and selling products. And there's also the TikTok. Yes. TikTok is well known in um, places outside of China. In China is Douyin. And so um, there are celebrities selling products online there as well. So this is, there is this one entrepreneur called Luo Yun Hao. Um, which is a very uh, interesting entrepreneur and he has his own company selling cell phones and just uh, uh, about a month ago on um, April the 1st and he did this live streaming show on Douyin which is you know TikTok in the uh, outside and so for three hours for three hours I think he sold 110 million yuan products and that's about 11 million pound. Wow. And that's for three hours. And, and he attracted 48 million visitors just watching him there 
and in the room and basically broadcasting these products and selling. But of course, he's a celebrity that also says the power of the celebrity. And this is happening not just with these, um, you know, sort of selling regular products. We're also talking about local government leaders. And so these local government leaders, especially seeing the farmers having lots of products, you know, not being able to sell because of the lockdown. And they saw this opportunity. So recently what I've been observing is these local government leaders, they are going these platforms. They are basically trying to endorse these products and selling, hey, come buy our, you know, potatoes, tomatoes, and all these products. Live streaming potatoes. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, yes. And, and, and in fact, I bought some. Yeah. And you bought potatoes or well, what did you buy, Julia? Well, I actually bought quite a few because I wanted to support Wuhan. So yeah. there are different ways to support that. So recently, a lot of my grocery has been, uh, you know, from Wuhan. That's sort of as my way to show, yeah. you know, my support. And turns out most of the products were really good. And quite literally farm to table, right? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. For the, example, you know, the potatoes I bought and Wuhan is known for all kinds of noodles, you know, uh, so I bought them um, and they were just fantastic and also makes me feel good. <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, uh, I, I suspect we're running out of time. Um, one, one last element of, the, uh, of this story, also from a micro perspective, uh, and this has to do with uh, employment. And if a small yeah. business, uh, if you're a small business owner, one of the most uh, wrenching uh, and difficult decisions at the moment is saying, I have no money coming in or very little money coming in. I have all of these employees who've been with me, whose skills I value greatly, yes. who've been with me often for a long time. Uh, and uh, I can't, afford to pay them anymore uh, and I don't know how long. Um, how have Chinese business owners that you're familiar with or uh, dealt with that and specifically any any sort of insights on what you've learned um, on, on the issue of employment which is so crucial to small business owners? No, no, that's that's really, really a good question. And in fact, I was just watching CNN um, this morning, looking at the unemployment number. Um, it's just a scary, and I can see the pain um, people are going through, as well as the you know small business owners, the pain they are going through. And we had that our share um, earlier on. Um, but one thing that I noticed, which I thought was really brilliant, um, really brilliant, and I hope that could be heard by other people. Hopefully, it will benefit other people as well is what I've seen in China at that time, we observed these employee sharing programs. So what does that mean? It's like you yeah. can think about, it's like you have carpool, you have car sharing, you have Airbnb apartment sharing, but here what business owners are doing is employee sharing. Because during the lockdown, most, all the, almost all the restaurants were closed. Yeah. And, but the owners had to pay their um, employees you know, base salary, as well as some of the coverage of insurance, et cetera, um, is a huge burden. And these people, you know, uh, both the owner and the employees, you know, the situation is, is, is terrible. On the other hand, because of the lockdown, the online service, grocery delivery, those kind of service were in high demand. And so, for example, like for these O2 online grocery stores like Hema, which belongs to um, Alibaba, and Daily Fresh, all these online platforms, they were just in desperate need of workers, of delivery guy. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was these two groups of owners, business owners, they joined together and they tried to do employee sharing. So for restaurant waiters and waitresses, right now you don't have a job, you could be hired by these online grocery platforms and you could be the delivery guy. Mm -hmm. And so that started earlier, um, but quickly got spread. Um, mm -hmm. So many restaurant owners joined the program and their employees were able to find job in these online grocery platforms um, and also get paid um, half employment. And that also cuts the cost of these restaurant owners as well. Yeah. That lasted for quite some time, which I thought was really sort of 
um, a brilliant solution for a problem and benefited everybody. Yeah, and I can think of it uh, uh, on two levels. One is, you know, um, the waiter providing delivery services where, you know, you may be an extremely skilled waiter. It may not necessarily help, those skills may or may not help you in your delivery service. On the other hand, you know, maybe you specialize in, you're a chef, uh, you specialize, uh, or a sous chef, you, you specialize in food from a certain uh, place, but you get moved to someplace else. Maybe your skills, will, your capabilities could be helpful uh, somewhere else as well. And so it's not, it's not only unskilled uh, applications, but by yeah, yeah. bringing new capabilities together, you might be creating uh, entirely new businesses or business uh, formats uh, as well, right? So either bringing yes. digital capabilities, delivery capabilities to many restaurants, as we think about what will happen with the world of restaurants, what will the restaurant of tomorrow look like? Well, having yes. firsthand delivery experience uh, uh, might be helpful to, uh, 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 to understand that. Uh, or uh, fascinating because we think about recombination uh, as a source of innovation. Right, so you Absolutely. bring together people with very different skills, and that may uh, uh, yield uh, combinations that uh, that are valuable. Uh, and I can see just through the act of employee sharing, not only sort of uh, um, uh, economic benefits, but or, and, and psychological benefits, uh, but also um, innovation benefits. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Yeah. And one could think of platforms that help facilitate that as well. Yeah. I think, I think people were sort of doing flexible um, working schedules already um, separately offline. But I think during the pandemic, this became such a popular thing. I could see this might change um, how people choose to work and how employers choose to hire employees um, down the road. Yeah, uh, it puts a whole different spin to gig economy, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. You could be working full time, except yes. with, uh, uh, and, and they have many of the benefits of working full time, but be shared across. Uh, uh, that's that's really really cool. Absolutely, Juliet. I know we could keep going uh, and, and and keep talking about all of the things, uh, but I'm, I'm I, I I look here. We're running out of time. So uh, let me just uh, wrap here by, by saying thank you so much. A, I'm so glad to see you're uh, not only well, just as energetic as, as always, and just as insightful uh, and, uh, and knowledgeable and able to, able to communicate across different worlds, just as always. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and, and, and please stay safe. I give my uh, regards to Jack and the kids. Uh, and... Uh, a quick note before we go to the uh, to those who are watching, um, please join for other series, uh, other uh, videos of this series of the COVID conversation series. We are uh, we are constantly in the process of developing further um, videos as well as uh, uh, more conversations. Hopefully, uh, Julia, we'll we'll have you back here uh, uh, in another one of these part two conversations. Uh, as I'd love to. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rajesh. Um, and if I could just add one more thing, Please. and also maybe to the audience uh, in front of the Zoom or camera or whatever platform you are using, because um, this uh, for us we have been through this for almost like you know five months uh, or close to five months, four and a half. Um, actually, because I'm a consumer behavior researcher, we actually started collecting data. Um, in the midst of this, and we wanted to understand, you know, how stressful people were and uh, what could be done in order to reduce the stress level. Um, so based on our large data collection, uh, we found something quite amazing, which I thought would be nice to share and also end my uh, conversation with Rajesh here, was um, even though the stress level was high, but we were able to find that when people focus more their attention um, and efforts in helping others, they actually find a better sense of fulfillment. And that heightened sense of fulfillment actually reduces their stress level. I thought that was um, 
very inspiring um, from our data. You know, normally we look at these data looking for significance, you know, as a code scientist. But when I look at the data um, during this period of time, uh, I was very, um, I was very pleased. So um, I just wanted to share it with everybody that, you know, protect yourself, but at the same time, help those that way you can and actually will help you in the end as well. So thank you. A wonderful line to, uh, to end with. Thank you again. Uh, and uh, stay safe, Julius. Great. Well, thank you, Rajesh. Bye.